What does it mean for us to be human? Well, Psalm 8 gives you two different important uh, themes. First, we are within creation. We are among God's creatures. In fact, we're pretty tiny among God's creatures. Even the psalmist figured that out in the ancient Near East. That, I mean, all it takes is to be out in the wilderness on a starry night to realize that we don't add up to all that much, at least not on the scale of mass and energy and space and time. The psalmist already gets that. Uh, we know a, a much bigger universe than, than they did back then, but still, the, the point still applies. Who do we think we are when we see the scope of the universe? That's one strain here. The other one is that we are, in a sense, over creation, or at least over significant elements of creation. Wow, you've made us a little less than God. You've set the world at our feet. You've given us dominion. Um, you've made us trustees of your own creation. We have a kind of power here in creation that's unrivaled. And the psalmist actually magnifies that. He set us over these things. Let me give you two pictures to illustrate this. The first one is a famous picture from the Sistine Chapel's ceiling. You probably know it. Now which strain is, is prominent here? Well, look at the resemblance. Look at the gaze. The creator and the creature aren't quite touching, and there's a vast gulf in that tiny space between the two fingers because they actually can't touch. Can they? I mean, God doesn't have fingers. That narrow little space is actually an in, is what Karl Barth called an infinite qualitative distance. Nevertheless, look at the resemblance that crosses that distance. Look at the gaze that meets. Look at the relationship that's between these two utterly dissimilar and yet similar beings. This portrays the unportrayable. And look, Adam's at the top of the mountain. He's at the top of the heap. Well, the Renaissance was a period of, of uh, humanism, right? It was a period of, of a restoration of <coughs> classical convictions of human power and strength and wonderfulness. So you can see how, in, in the spirit of the Renaissance, we're resonating with one strain of that song. Let me give you another picture. This is from the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It's actually not a picture. It's a sculpture above one of the doors. It, it too, portrays the creation of human beings. But what's happening here sounds a little like Genesis 2. God made humanity from the dust of the earth. And you see us rising out of primordial stuff. You also see a little bit of uh, Genesis 1. Male and female, he created them. It's in Genesis 2 that they're split out and distinguished, and it's made, it's made obvious that we're not complete without one another. But here, that point is, and, and in Genesis 1, that point is made by mentioning the sexes together. That's a 20th century creation here. 20th century was a pretty humiliating century for people who were feeling confident in human ability and human progress. It was a, World War I was humbling, World War II was more humbling. Just the fact that more people died violently in the 20th century than all the other ones put together left people thinking, hey, maybe we're not all that hot stuff after all. And so, so this looks like it resonates a little more with the other strain of Psalm 8. Who do we think we are? We're, we're the stuff of the earth. We're, we're stuff. It's hard to hold these two claims together, isn't it? It's easy to lapse into embarrassment or shame or to veer over to the other extreme of pride and arrogance. And Psalm 8 holds the two strains together in what we call a dialectic. A dialectic is two claims placed side by side that you have to appreciate at the same time if you're going to understand the point. Who do we think we are? And yet, you've set the world at our feet. 
How could you even be mindful of us? And yet, we are a little less than God. That is the nuance of humanity itself. And that's what we need to look at today. What is it about human beings that warrants the kind of talk in, in Psalm 8? Uh, what distinguishes humans among all of God's creatures? Because God has made a whole lot of kinds of creatures. What distinguishes us? Well, I'm not sure that the quick answer is, is the full answer. But a, a, but, a, but a pretty immediate, typical Christian response would be, well, we're in the image of God. That's what distinguishes us. And that's right. It does. Even angels aren't called images of God. But it begs a question. What does it mean to be an image of God? How do we image God? What is it about us that images God? In some sense, imago Dei, which is the Latin for image of God, everybody say it because we're not very good at pronouncing it. Imago Dei. Imago Dei. Good. You'll remember it better now. It sounds like we're in third grade, but you know, I learned a lot in third grade. The, um, the, the term comes out of Genesis 126. Let us make Adam in our image, after our likeness. Even though that term is used very rarely in the Bible, it comes to dominate classical theology because it seems to capture something, something that needs unpacking. We image God. How? Well, lots of, lots of voices over the centuries have given us lots of different answers. I'm grouping them together to make this a little more manageable and then to draw something out that comes later on. So one way that it's commonly worked out is in terms of personal faculties. There are things about me that are uniquely human and things about you that are uniquely human that are how we image God. For instance, and this again is a very common answer, we have souls. What are souls? Well, I don't know. Souls are whatever the, whatever it is that's uniquely human and transcendent. <coughs> How this plays out in, in later theology and philosophy, it, it plays out in several ways of understanding the human constitution. One of them gets called metaphysical dualism. The idea that a human being is, is irreducibly a two-part being, a soul plus a body. But the real human identity resides in the soul, not the body. This was an ancient Greek conviction. This is not a specifically Jewish conviction. You actually aren't going to see much of this at all in the Old Testament, and arguably not a whole lot of it in the New Testament. But because it was part of the metaphysical convictions of the Greco-Roman world, uh, it, it still dominates to this day. The idea that the real me is the, is the immortal, immaterial, spiritual soul. It's that, little white, it's that little white thing that floats above a dying body in Harry Potter. <laughs> it needs to be stuffed back in. All right, metaphysical dualism. This conviction of dualism that we're really two-part creatures has come under fire, especially from the sciences, in the, in the form of physicalism, the conviction that we are entirely material beings, or if you like, that we have no souls, at least not in the sense of a soul being something that isn't physical, or isn't material, isn't organic. All right? You might have, well, good grief. I mean, you encounter that every day in our wider culture conviction that I'm just, I'm just a body. Um, physicalism takes more than one form, though. The usual one is called reductive physicalism. That means that I am just a bunch of chemicals. I'm just mostly water and some other stuff. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and, and other stuff. 
And uh, it happens to be arranged in the form you see in front of you, but really I'm just a chemical thing. When you hear that. There is, however, another form of physicalism that actually a number of you will encounter here at Westmont because some of our faculty explore it pretty, pretty uh, vocally. It's called non-reductive physicalism. At different levels of complexity, stuff takes on properties that don't reduce to those more primitive levels of complexity. Subatomic particles behave in certain ways that are best understood in the physics department. But the physics department is not the best place to understand how atoms interact with atoms and how molecules interact with molecules. The best place to do that is the chemistry department because at that level of complexity, matter takes on properties that don't reduce to the behaviors of the subatomic particles. And when those, when those molecules, chemicals, are arranged in certain ways in certain relationships, they become self-sustaining at least with the provision of regular inputs of energy. And the best place to study those relationships isn't the chemistry department, right? It's the biology department. Because at those levels of complexity, the matter takes on qualities, traits, we call life, that don't reduce to chemical reactions and can't be entirely and well understood as mere chemical reactions. I mean, yeah, you can learn the Krebs cycle. But you haven't really understood life just by reducing it down. All right? Those arrangements, now the biology department will take care of increasing layers of, layers of complexity all the way up to habitats. When you start talking about specifically social relationships among these organisms, you leave the biology department, you go over to the sociology or the anthropology department. When you look at the functioning of a human being, you go to the psych department because there are what these sciences call emergent qualities of creation as it shifts from levels of complexity. All right? It's not best to understand me as just a bunch of chemicals. Better understand me maybe in terms of a psyche. in terms of a self. Okay? This is non-reductive physicalism. And it's also better to understand me not just as a self, but as, a, as an American. And that brings up other levels of emergent complexity too, right? I act the way I act because I'm an American. So now I need a, not just a cultural anthropology angle, but I need a history angle to find out what forces, you know, in, in English and art and the rest to help get at how specifically Americans act in the strange ways that we do. All right? That's non-reductive physicalism. You can, you can say that humans aren't just chemicals without having to posit a metaphysical soul that's not bodily, that's not physical. I didn't go to the theological level. What about our relationships with God? And those will come back. How else might we image God? Well, I'm not commending this as a good answer, but it's at least a mildly influential answer. Maybe God has a body. Actually, it's quite influential in some circles. Uh, maybe God has a body. We're bodies. We've got two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears. Etc. Um, maybe we image God because God is a, you know, sort of a Zeus figure, someone up there, wherever there is, who has a lot of that same stuff. Finnis Jennings Dake was a Pentecostal leader who uh, wrote a, a self-contained Bible commentary called the Dake Bible, which is pretty interesting stuff. He was a thoroughgoing biblical literalist. It's the word of God, therefore it literally, you know, it is literally true. And what that means is if it says God has an arm, God has an arm. 
If it says God has a mouth, and God has a mouth. If it says God has wings, then I guess he has wings. Um, so Daig inferred that God actually is a physical being with a body. Now, the church rejected that kind of thinking a lot earlier than Daig. Um, you might, you know, there's... It's one popular description of God in some confessions of some of our churches that God is without body, parts, or passions. God is not a creature. Our kinds of moods and changing behaviors based on, you know, endocrinological changes and the like, that doesn't describe what it means when it says God is angry or God is happy or God is whatever. Those, those are analogies that you can't just use in the other direction to describe to decide that God has a, a brain. All right. So although this is a popular conception of God, or at least a lot of non-Christians think Christians and must believe in some heavenly big old dude with a beard, the church has actually rejected that firmly. It's not the right way to understand Imago Dei. What about aspects that you think of as physical but that seem to transcend brute matter. Athanasius, fourth century, very influential, brilliant theologian. He's probably more than anyone responsible for the Nicene Creed and for Trinitarian theology being as normative as it is. Athanasius described our Imago Dei in terms of our powers of reasoning, powers of speaking. The beasts don't do that, but we do it. We use words to reason. We use logic to think. And that is how we reflect the logos, or the word, of the Father, through whom all things were made. It's appropriate that a wordly God, you know, a God who is logos, should be imaged in wordly people, in people who think with language who reason with logic. That becomes a very influential way of thinking about what makes us different. And it makes us a little nervous when animals seem to have at least rudimentary powers of reasoning. Or when our powers of reasoning turn out to be intuitions that have some of the same character as theirs. or where our patterns of reasoning seem to have evolutionary histories behind them. You can see how this makes an Athanasian Christian nervous, because it suggests that reasoning and, and even speaking isn't uniquely human. Although the human way of it is, that's worth remembering. Or, and this is close to Athanasius, Augustine taught that our human mind, which you'll encounter later when we talk about the Trinity, which has sort of echoes of divinity in its own structure, our human mind allows us to understand ourselves, to contemplate, to contemplate the universe, to contemplate God, and to contemplate ourselves. And that is how we image God at least one of the ways that we image God, according to Augustine. So, all of those different answers, and they are different answers, still root Imago Dei in personal human faculties, all right? Individual human qualities. 